Good evening. Welcome everyone out to service tonight. Been a good day, amen. Busy day, but a good day. Uh, thankful to be in this house tonight. Thankful for everyone that's here. Um, I haven't said this in a little while, but aren't you thankful that we can have church on Sunday night? Yeah, it's just about a thing of the past in churches, but I'm, I'm glad there's still enough of us come out here we can have church on Sunday, uh, Sunday evening. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We have any prayer requests? Or? Remember that in a special way. Charles is still sick. <laughs> Remember Brother Charles in Velvet. Tina went home sick. Miguel? Remember that uh, once Miguel talked to him, Ross. Bonnie's here. Uh, all her satisfied? <laughs> Remember that. Remember all the kids. All heart satisfied. Invite everyone down to the altar. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Brother Bo, you want to lead us, please? the singers come. Let us worship the Lord. If you have testimony, please give it.
I got to testify first just to God's goodness and how he can reach down and show us something we're doing wrong we didn't even know and then heal us. And you almost want to feel guilty. Like, I, I didn't even get to feel bad about that. But he relieved me of some things. And life has just been different. I've been a Christian for 25 years. And he's still in the business of changing and molding our lives and relieving us of things. Holy is the name of Jesus. Holy is the great I am. Ever worthy to be worshipped and adored. Lord of heaven and of earth. Awesome is your name. How awesome is your name in all the earth. We give you all the glory as we worship at your throne. In your presence there is healing as we call upon your name. Through you the universe experiences its birth and forever will proclaim. How awesome is your name, oh, how awesome is your name in all the earth, we give you all the glory as we worship at your throne. My heart is so proud My mind is so unfocused I see the things you do through me As great things I have done And now you gently break me Then lovingly you take me And hold me as my father and mold me as my maker I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down and even though I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and it's all seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace at times I may grow weak and feel a bit discouraged knowing that someone somewhere could do a better job for who am i to serve you i know i don't deserve you and that's the part that burns in my heart and keeps me hanging on i ask you how many times will you pick me up when i keep on letting you down Short of your glory, 
As I walk with you, I'm learning what your grace really means. The price that I could never pay was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my hiding you're safe here with me there's no need to cover what I already see you've got your reasons but I hold your peace you've been a lockdown and I hold the key cause I loved you you knew what was love And I saw it all Still I chose the cross And you were the one That I was thinking of When I rose from the grave Now rid of the shackles My victory's yours I tore the veil For you to come close There's no reason distance anymore you're not far from home and I'll be your lighthouse when you're lost at sea and I will illuminate everything no need to be frightened by intimacy chose the cross and you were the one that I was thinking of when I rose from the grave now rid of the shackles my victory's yours I tore the veil for you to come close there's no reason to 
stand at a distance anymore. You're not far from home. And oh, as you run, white-handed love will only become a part of the story. And oh, as you run, what hindered love will only become part of the story? Cause I loved you before you knew what was love And I saw it all, still I chose the cross And you were the one that I was thinking of when I wrote from the grave now rid of the shackles my victory's yours and i tore the veil for you to come close there's no reason to stand at a distance anymore you're not far from I love you a lot For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness And all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so It's running after, it's running after me. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, Lord, I surrender now. Lord, I give you everything. For your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing
sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord. Before, before Brother Miguel comes, I want to I wanna share a testimony with you guys. This really meant a lot to me. I don't know if it will mean anything to you guys, but um, I was listening to a podcast the other day. <clears throat> in the Genesis 1.16, uh, down at the end of the verse, after, after, the, after God created the heavens and the earth and everything that there was and, and all the creation that he was doing, there's a little little tag on the end of verse 16 and it says he made the stars also and that's always struck me as kind of strange you know we think the the just all the amazing things that are in the sky and it's like god just tagged that on there that he made the stars also <clears throat> i was listening to this program and there was this astrophysicist on there and now an astrophysicist is like one of the, the smartest people on the planet and you know all these degrees and super smart and all this here this astrophysicist um, was an atheist they did not believe in God, did not believe there was any such thing as God, did not believe in creation, did not believe in any of that, was trained up, uh, was raised in a non-Christian home, atheistic home, and w went to school and was taught that there was no God. And so now this person is extremely uh, crazy smart, and they start to study um, the solar system and, and all, all the things that are out there in the sky. And... I've always thought that the Bible, the Bible very clearly portrays that earth is what it's all about, right? That's where mankind's at. God loved the world. God loved mankind. And it's all about the earth. And then you got all this other stuff out there. you got the planets and the stars and all this stuff. And I've always thought, you know, God really did a lot that has nothing to do with us, you know? And they say there's trillions of galaxies and, you know, all the things that are up there. But this astrophysicist, uh, this is what they said. Just within the last, I don't remember what they said, 40 years or something, just very, very recently, because it's something that they never could see before or understand, they, they started to understand about black holes. And you guys have probably heard about black holes. But they're, the, like the sun has like a thousand times more gravitational pull than the earth. And what keeps it from folding in on itself is there are nuclear explosions going in all the time pushing it out so they're pushing it out and the gravity is pulling it in well black hole is when a star stops making those uh, uh, nuclear explosions and pushing out and it just basically the gravity just sucks it within so anyways all that doesn't matter Here, here's a point <clears throat> this astrophysicist studied that out and after they after they thoroughly studied it then they went back and they read genesis and they said, knowing what we know now, there's no other way it could be than exactly the way it's written in Genesis. And this astrophysicist got saved and gave her heart to the Lord because of that. And here's the thought that this is what was part of the blessing to me. Though for thousands of years, we didn't even know there was such things as a black hole. Though for thousands of years, there was all those trillions of galaxies up there that no one even had any impact on us. And though all of that was done, God would have created all of them stars and galaxies and all of those black holes to save one person from hell. Let's think about that. And I thought, you know, that seems like an awful lot in our eyes that God did all of that to keep one person out of hell. But you know God would do that to keep one person out of hell? And that was a blessing to me that that, uh, that that was the way that that person understood that there is a God and that they come to know the Lord was was through something that 
no one has ever really known until just recently. So, so I, that was a real blessing to my heart. So, brother. Mm-hmm. Sure. 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 The, and to Richard's point, this astrophysicist now, who is greatly respected, is telling everybody, there is a God. There's no other way. There is a God. Literally, if you understand all that they understand, there is no other way. There is a God. <laughs> God's got a pretty good testimony going on. Hey, man, he's got a pretty good testimony going on. That, that's just exciting to me. So Brother Miguel is going to come preach for us. Uh, give him your attention. Let us pray, church. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just once again come before you to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we uh, can come uh, before you, Lord, and uh, spend time in your word. Father, we can spend time with other brothers and sisters, Father, and we just want to worship your name, Father. Father, help us, Lord. Help us understand more about your word, Father. Help us understand more of you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the heavens and the earth, Lord, the things that you created, Father. Father, so that we can know you, Lord. Father, we thank you that you are faithful to your word and you will never, your word will never, ever return void. I thank you for the hearts that are here today, Lord. I pray that you would open up their hearts to receive your message. Father, you know what they're going through. You know what every situation they're dealing with, Lord. Give them strength, Father, I pray. Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, Amen church. All right. Open up your Bibles to the book of Luke book of Luke. Find your way to chapter 3, if you will. As uh, some of you have probably uh, already noticed, we once again have come to the end of another chapter. And I am, I am really excited. Not because I'm trying to rush through these. I mean, we started preaching through the series of Luke back in November, and we're just now three chapters in. So, I'm not, it's obvious that I'm in no rush. And I kind of felt bad a little bit about this until uh, Josh says that he's been preaching the same thing for three years. <laughs> so, I'm like, I'm not in bad company. So, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for this, though, church. Seriously, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to go through and, and, and just give you what God's word has to say outside of my opinion or outside of my thoughts. Um, it's such a blessing to be able to just stand here and say, thus say the word of God. I share this all the time when I go out and share share the um, share my faith with people. I, one of the things that I tell them is, uh, you know, if if I've never met them, I tell them you never met me, right? And most of them will say no. And I was, and then I go and ask them. I ask them, Sister Georgie, uh, if I was to tell you right now that I make mistakes, would you believe me? And everybody says yes. And then I ask them why? Why do you think that I make mistakes? And then the the, the answer is pretty common because. Everybody makes mistakes. It's a pretty common thing. Everybody knows. You don't have to believe in God to know that everybody makes mistakes, right? And then I say, what if I was to tell you that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to the Father? Would you believe me then? And then some of them, if they don't know, they were like, yeah, you know, why would you lie? And other people say yes, you know, depending on their convictions. And then I ask them, why? Why do you believe me when I say that if I just, we just clarified that I make mistakes? Could I be wrong? And then, you know, they give me some kind of answer. And the truth is that I could be wrong. But you know what? The word of God is never wrong. Amen. The word of God is never wrong. So I'm not standing here under my own authority and telling you this is what I believe. I'm just going through the word of God. And it has been such a blessing to me. And I, hope, I pray that it's been a blessing to you. You guys have probably seen the handouts. So don't. I got, again, I, I got good news for you. I'm not going to preach through the whole series of the handouts. I think by now everybody understands what I'm doing. Uh, hopefully the handouts that I give you is to help you with the studying. They have truly become a, a, a blessing to me as I, as I read through these different uh, chapters, understanding who I'm reading about. And not just that, but in understanding the places that we're, we're reading and then, you know, to, to locate them on a map has, uh, has just been, uh, has been helpful in my study. So I, I'm, I pray that it's helpful to you and um, maybe you can hand them out to someone else if, uh, if you're done with them. So um, we preach over and over and over again that we don't want you to leave here with head knowledge, right? That's what we tell you. But I also want to say that head knowledge 
it's not a bad thing. It's not the only thing, but it's not a bad thing. Picture it like this, right? My wife, I, I love my wife very much. Um, but can I tell you, if I forget her birthday, she'd be very upset. I need to know her birthday, <laughs> right? I need to know those special dates, right? Those are very important. However, even if I remember every single date, if I'm unfaithful to her, none of that matters. So while knowledge is not a bad thing, it's not the only thing. Right. Amen? So that's, that's why I do this for you, you know, what we, we should have a balance of both in our lives, all right? Uh, I give you the names of the people. I give you a, uh, uh, a name of the places that we cover in the chapters. I put it on a map. And this time I've given you a little bit of uh, something else. I've given you um, two genealogies, uh, one in Matthew, one in Luke. And then I gave you a list of, uh, uh, I give you a list of, uh, of names uh, or, or kings, excuse me, from, from, uh, from Israel. Now, I say this sincerely and truthfully, chapter 3 has been one of the toughest chapters that I've uh, preached through, um, and the reason why is not because it's hard to understand, it's really easy to understand, but because it has so much history in it, and one of the things that I've been told in multiple occasions by different people is that when you're preaching, you don't want to just beat them over the head with facts, and I struggle with that, church, because I love facts. And I want to give you those facts. I want to tell you everything that I studied. And I studied for a long time. And I want you to be here with me as long as I've studied. I want you to be here uh, listening to everything that I have to say. But that's not the point of a message. I have to give you what does say the word of God, the message that God has given me to give to you. So I'm, I'm giving these things to, you know, to, to kind of help you. Now, we also have come to uh, the last part, which also uh, raises a challenge, is a genealogy. Now, I haven't been raised in church my entire life, as uh, some of you lifers have. I haven't uh, sat through many preachings, uh, but there is a, 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 a common thing that um, genealogies, uh, they, they tend to be boring. They have the potential to be boring. And with me behind the pulpit, they have a really big potential. So I have a, I'm not going to preach through the genealogy of, of, of Luke. Is that all right? I'm going to preach through genealogy of Luke and Matthew. <laughs> and there's a potential third one, and, and I hope you understand. But in order to make it a little bit more interesting, and I hope you understand, I, I, I've given you this, uh, this title here that, that maybe it catches your eye. You know, in, in modern age, they call that, that clickbait. Clickbait. And, and, and clickbait has a, a tendency to be a bad thing, but I just, want, I just want to hold your attention as long as possible. Is that okay? So... The, the title of this uh, message or the cover page, it says, uh, is the New Testament broken? Is the New Testament broken? And I know many of you here are, are wondering where is he going with this church? I have found a problem in the New Testament. And before you start throwing stuff at me, let me just say, you shouldn't get offended when you hear statements like that. You shouldn't get offended. As a matter of fact, there's many problems in the Bible. Did you know that? One of the biggest problems is that the wages of sin is death. That means that because of our sin, we deserve hell. That's a big problem. And then on top of that, nothing that we can do our righteousness or as dirty rags, there's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. Now, church, that's a big problem. However, for every problem that you encounter in the Bible, there is an answer. Okay? Because rest, rest, rest at ease. For every problem that we encounter, there's an answer. So you shouldn't get offended. I say that. But I do want to say that I did get offended when I encountered the problem. So you, right now you're in Luke, but I want you to hold your spot, and I want you to turn to, to, um, to the book of Matthew, Matthew 1. And we're going to uh, just find your way there. And let me tell you how I came across this problem. I was, uh, I was working out, lifting probably the weight of a small house or something, and, and I was playing like a YouTube video in the background, and this video came, and, and they, um, they, they, they said that there was, a, there was a problem with the New Testament. Now, immediately, I got offended. I tell you not to get offended, but I'm giving you my honest reaction. And here's why I got offended, okay? I got offended because the New Testament, the, the Bible as a whole, but the New Testament specifically is something that I've been studying since I gave my life to Christ. I didn't believe 
the things that I read and heard in the New Testament because somebody with eloquent words or with a nice suit told me these things. I actually took my time and I studied these things out. So when I heard someone says that, that there was a problem and the New Testament was broken, it immediately caught my attention. So I heard him out and I, I kind of was shutting out the things that he had to say. But then I, I, I began praying and, and I realized that we have to hear these problems, church. We can't just close our, 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 our ears and la, 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 I can't hear you. No, we can't do that. When the world presents us with issues, we have to be able to hear them, and we also have to be able to have an answer for them. We have to be ready. So I present this problem to you, and I'm also going to present you with the answer in the hopes that when we encounter problems like this, we can take a biblical look, and we can answer these questions effectively. Amen? Now, Real quick, we're just going to uh, discuss a couple of things about the genealogies. I gave you a handout about the genealogies in Matthew and, and Luke. And if you take a look at them, immediately you will see a couple of differences. If you look at them in, in the Bible, one of the big differences you see is that in Matthew, the genealogy is descending. And in Luke, or I'm sorry, I got it the other way. In, in Matthew, it's ascending. And in Luke is descending the genealogy. And what I mean by that is, uh, in, in Matthew it begins with uh, with, with Abraham, and it's ascending. It, it, it goes all the way up to Jesus. And in Luke is descending, meaning it begins with uh, it begins with Jesus, and it descends, and it gives us the genealogy of Jesus all the way to 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 Adam. Now they're both genealogies of Jesus, uh, but they're they're listed in different order. That's a pretty obvious difference, right? We, we, can, we can see that, right? However, there's another problem. That's pretty obvious, too. I mean, it, it, one stops at Abraham, another one stops at Adam. That's not a big deal, right? One just goes further than the other. You continue to examine a little bit further, and you see uh, there's a couple of other differences. Uh, one of the differences that you see is that uh, when it talks about the father of Joseph, it gives you two different names. Did you guys see that? Did you see that Joseph had two different fathers? Now, I gave you a sheet sheet, so you probably already recognize what the answer to that, right? And I don't have time to go through all the detail of how come have come to the conclusion that we've come to. Uh, so this is where I'll leave you with a little bit of homework, right? I believe that the genealogy of Matthew lists the paternal side, or, or should I say the stepfather side, uh, the, the, through uh, the, the line of Joseph, and I believe that the genealogy of Luke goes through the maternal side, meaning it goes through Mary. Now, there's a couple of problems with this also. I, I, there's not 100% concrete, right? Uh, one of the, the, the problems is that most of the people didn't do uh, genealogies for women back in those days. It just wasn't a common thing. But even in this, I believe there's an answer, and again, I don't have time to go on through through all the details of that, you know. Um, so as, as, we're, as we're reading through this, we see that those differences are not, they're not major. They're not, they're not breaking. They're not what's the potential problem with the New Testament. Now, again, there is, when you read the genealogy of Matthew, there is a big glaring problem. There's a really, really big problem. A problem, and I'm not being facetious here, a, a problem, Sister Georgia, that has the potential to break the New Testament. This is some serious stuff, church. And rather than to hide under a rock, we should investigate this and figure out what the problem is. Amen? So we're going to read it. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12. And let me just tell you, if you're sitting next to somebody, hold their hand. If you're by yourself, just hold on to the seat. This is uh, some serious stuff here. I'll put my glasses on here so I can... Uh, if I do have my glasses, here they are. All right, church, you ready? All right, let's do this together. It says, verse 11, And Josiah begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Selethiel. Even Josh had to get up and get out of the way. This is, uh, this is some serious stuff. Can you believe what we just read? This is some serious stuff, church. 
Maybe, maybe you don't recognize the name, okay? Maybe, maybe the names are not familiar to you. How about, how about if I say it like this? So in verse 11, it says Jeconias. How about if I say this? Uh, uh, Jeconiah. No? Still nothing? All right, well, what if I do this? You're coaching. Still nothing? I guess we're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. That's all right. We got all day, right? I'm being facetious here, church. But if you understand what Jesus was or who Jesus was or what the Messiah meant to this people, you will understand the problem. Okay, so we, we just spent time looking at verses, uh, chapters 1 and 2 in Luke. And one of the things that was prophesied about Jesus was that Jesus, if he was the Messiah, he wasn't just going to come and be a savior, but he was going to fulfill a political title. Amen? He was going to be a king that was going to sit on the throne of David. That was prophesied. That was prophesied that the, that the Messiah was going to be from the lineage and the seed of David and feel a political title. He was going to be a king, over, rule over the earth. Do you guys remember that? However, there is a problem. There's a problem because the man that we listed here, the, the man that we named here, God had put a, should I say a curse? God had prohibited this man from his lineage to uh, to rain that's a serious problem let me tell you why it's a serious problem because if this is true then that means that God went against his word if this is true that means that God the things that he gave us the things that he prophesied are not real and if one thing is not real then that means the whole thing is not real do you understand how serious that is now would God go against his own word now so you don't have to bite your nails the whole time. I'll just give you the answer, okay? I'll give you the answer of why, uh, or what, what's the answer to this. You ready? Jesus. Let's wrap it up, church. Jesus. Isn't that amazing how you can just use Jesus for anything? Jesus. However, this is going to be a math problem like you used to have in school, right? You get the answer, but now you got to work your way up and come and see how you come to that conclusion. So if you allow me, turn your Bibles. Keep, keep your, your hand on, on Matthew and Luke. We'll come back to those. But we're going to take a trip to the Old Testament. We're going to go to the book of Jeremiah, okay? Jeremiah 22 to be exact. And while you're going there, let me tell you, give you a picture of what's going on. At this point in history, the kingdom of Israel has already been split in two. All right? There's two kings. There's the northern part of Israel and then there's the southern, Judea, right? And, and Jeremiah is a prophet to the nation of Judea. And, he, and he's a, a prophet and he prophesies uh, to a king named Josiah. Okay? That's why I gave you a list of the kings. So as you find your way there, we're going to be reading verses. Uh, we're going to be kind of reading through the different verses here in, in Jeremiah. But we're going to begin with verse 1. Chapter 22. I'm sorry, Brother Richard. Thank you for uh, chapter 22. Say amen when you're there. Amen. All right, then wait for me then. <laughs> All right. All right, church. So this is Jeremiah speaking to... Uh, Josiah, the king, verse one, it says, thus saith the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sittest upon the throne of David, thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness and deliver the spoiled out of the hard, out of the hand of the oppressor and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger and fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. That's the end of chapter verse three there. That sounds pretty accurate to God, right? 
treat people right, do what's right, don't oppress the, uh, the people that are down. That sounds like God, right? So far, everything that we read sounds like God. Look, look at verse 4. It says, for if you do this thing indeed, then, there, then shall there enter in by the gates of this house king sitting upon the throne of David, riding chariots and on horses, he and the servants and his people. What he's saying to this uh, king is, if you do what I'm telling you, you're not just you, but your seed will prosper. Amen? If you do what I'm telling you, if you follow uh, my commandments, you're going to be all right. Your kingdom is going to do well. Again, that sounds just like something God would say. Amen? Verse 5. But, but if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself. That's important. Being no other greater name than the name of God, he swears on his own name. I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. That's a strong warning. Amen? That's a really strong warning. Saying if you don't do it, everything will, be, uh, will come down. Sounds pretty accurate to God, okay? These words were, were prophesied to Josiah. Now, later on, Josiah had sons, and his, one of his sons took uh, uh, his elder son. He took, uh, he took the kingdom. And he was only, only there brief, briefly. I got the name here for you, church. I wrote it down for us here. Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz was a king for a very brief time. Then after Jehoahaz uh, was carried away, he was carried away into captivity. His brother was appointed king of Judea. In verse 13, we see that his brother, it says, his brother being named Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, all right? So it says, woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages and, grant, and giveth him not for his uh, work. That, that saith, I will build me a wide house and a large chambers and, and cutting him out windows and is... Uh, and is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. Shall thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father sit and drink and do judgment and justice, and then it was well with him? What God is saying to him is that you, uh, Jehoiakim, you have uh, earned your kingdom. You have mistreated your people. Did I, did I not give you examples when your father, uh, J uh, Josiah, was in the throne? Did I not prosper his kingdom? And yet you're turning around and you're becoming an evil king? Did I not warn against this? We just read in verse 5 what would happen. Amen? We just read what would happen. What do you think is going to happen, church? Is God going to be faithful to his word? Will God keep his word to this, uh, to this evil king? Verse 18, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or ah, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or I, his glory. What the Lord just said to him is he just prophesied that because of his disobedience, no one was going to lament his death. He was going to be taken out of the kingdom. He was going to be taken to captivity and nobody was going to lament his death. But notice this church. Notice that God did not just uh, uh, bring punishment down on him, but it continues on. It continues on to, uh, to his son. Verse 24 and 25, it says, As I live, saith the Lord, 
thou Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, where the sight where where the signet upon the hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. What he's saying is Jeho Jehoachin, Je Coniah, the same Coniah that we read about in Matthew, he's saying, even though you wear the king, even though you are a king, I will take it away from you. I will take you out from being a king. Again, God being faithful and true to his word. Amen. But this is where it gets uh, where, it, where, it, where it gets even uh, deeper. If you look down, you see that that because of the disobedience of of the father of Kaniah, the punishment did not only go to Kaniah, which Kaniah was also a bad, a bad king, by the way. It also went to the rest of his seed. And this is where the problem ensues. Verse 30, it says, Thus saith the Lord, while ye write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. I don't know if I did a good job at painting to you this problem. This uh, uh, corner that God has painted himself into. But God just told Kaniah that none of his seed from the rest of his seed would sit on the throne of, of David. That's a big problem, church. That's a huge problem. Because knowing that God's word is true, now as we approach the New Testament, we see that the Messiah comes from the line of David. So how then? How how can this come to be true? Do you guys see the problem here? Do you guys see the problem that, that God has, has, uh, has just given his word that none of his seed would sit upon the throne? And now as we come into the New Testament, we see that Jesus comes from the line of David. So, Again, I hope that I've been able to demonstrate the problem that we have here. This is a big problem. When I heard this, Pastor, when I heard this man uh, uh, paint this problem out to me, he, he, he went through and he listed all these names. I went through and I took the problem he had given me and I looked it up in the Word and, and I came to the same conclusion as him, there is a problem. However, this is one thing that this man did not consider. Okay? This is one thing that this man who painted out this problem did not think about. And as we're going to look at John 1.1. 1, 1. We've heard this verse several times today. I was amazed how many times we heard it. It's a pretty familiar verse. It says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. Finish that with me, church. Who was Jesus? The son. God. Can I tell you the reason why there are so many problems in the Bible, so many people who think they have got you, I got you, Christians. The reason why is because they will not humble themselves to see that Jesus Christ was God. That is the problem. Listen, you can come up with as many problems as you want to, but if your conclusion is not that Jesus Christ is God and that God himself saw that mankind had a problem, so he had to come and be that answer, you will never see it. And it doesn't matter how you give it to them. They will never see it. Isn't that amazing? Listen, you can go and be an astrophysicist and go and study and, and believe you have all the answers. But if you don't believe that God sent his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life, no amount of staring up at the stars will save you. It just won't. You have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself and think that the Lord's ways are what? 
They're not my ways. Listen, his mind, the way that he thinks, is different from the way that I think. By all logic, it seems that God had painted himself into the corner. And then he says, just wait. Just wait, all right? Listen, I have an answer for the hardest of problems. He makes a way when there is no way. Okay, we're just talking about his birth. We're just taking a look at the virgin birth. It was through the virgin birth. It was through the way that Jesus came that he answered this big riddle, this big question. That was just his birth. Think about how much more his death meant. When the world seems like they have us, they have us trapped, Christian. Do you believe that God has the answer? Do you truly believe that? Because what if we get another four years, another 10 years of the wrong president in office? Oh, no. Praise God. Hallelujah. He has the answers. Here we saw there was evil kings. Kings so evil. Church. Say, God cursed the whole lineage and yet he still made a way he still made a way if that was true then that can't be true now can it of course not church why do we struggle why why do we give this false witness of who God is why do we do that they have questions the world has questions. Church, we have the answers. We truly do. Why do we get so offended? Why is it that we're ready to argue with someone and battle with someone instead of saying, hey, wait, listen, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about him. We believe that they have to look at Christianity our way. But even us, we realize that sometimes we're looking at Christianity the wrong way. So shouldn't we take a look at God's word and let God's word dictate who God is and let God have the answers for those questions, those hard questions? We asked this question a couple of sermons ago. If God is good, why would he let bad things happen to good people? There's a lot of that. Maybe take the time to go through the word and say, hey, look, there is no good people. But there is a good God. <laughs> Let me show you why God is good. We say it over and over and over. God is good. And all the time. We have been trained to say those things. Church, I say that sincerely. We have been trained to say it. And we can scream it at the top of the lungs. I witnessed that, was it two years ago in 2019 at, uh, 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 at the NOIC? Amy lost her voice. <laughs> Telling people oh, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Can we show them in, through scripture where God is good? Can we show them? Can we take them and say, hey, look, this is why God is good. God is good because he took a thief, a thief on the cross, and right before his death, he forgave him. He showed mercy to him. That's, a one, that's just one story of God's goodness. Here, you don't like church? You don't like religion? Let me show you where Jesus was good. Listen, he, look at these religious people who were, who were being rude and ugly to, to this sinner who was truly repentant. Jesus didn't like it either. Shows how good Jesus was because he would go and eat and dine with the sinners. Yet he never compromised. You want to know what God is good here? Let me show you how he took Israel and he freed them from slavery. Oh, no, the Bible teaches slavery. Well, no, no, no. Let me show you. Let me clarify that for you. Let me answer those tough questions that you have. Listen, there are legitimate questions. I remember I've shared this testimony many times. I shared this testimony how I was so angry because I was tired of hearing from men. Men who would say that this was the way. And I remember saying, God, I'm just tired. So many people trying to convince me to look like them, talk like them, be like them. I just want to be like you. I want to know the truth. 
I don't want to dress the part. Listen, there are people like that with humble new hearts that are just tired. They're fed up. And isn't that who Jesus is looking for? Isn't that what he says? Come to me if you're what? That's who he's looking for. Why do we get so offended? We have the answers. Let me show you uh, how good God is. He said that no one from this seed of Coniah would sit on the throne. In verse 6 of Matthew, it says, I guess I got to be in Matthew now to be able to read it, huh? In verse 6 of, of chapter 1, it says, And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. If you take a, a look at Luke and his genealogy, he also gives us a, a, a genealogy. And he also tells us about Jesse being the father of David. But he does something a little bit different. Look at, look with me. At verse 31. It says, which was the son of Malia, which was the son of Moriah, which was the son of Mahatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Nathan. In the Gospel of Matthew, he goes down the lineage of Solomon. But here we see he goes down the lineage of Nathan. Still remain true to his word. That's from the seed of David. Still remain true to his word. When it seems like he has, there is no hope, he goes through and delivers. Still remaining faithful to his word. Still remaining true. Never compromising, right? God has no ability to be wrong ever to tell a lie. And he's still able to, able to deliver the same result. That's all good and well. But how does that apply to me now and today can I tell you I don't know what storm or trial is going in your life whether you're sick whether you have issues with your job or one of the worst pains that a parent could ever feel is whether you have a child that's sick those are tough things not just a child that's sick, but having a loved one that is lost and on their way to hell. Amen. Who has denied all versions of Jesus? They want nothing to do with your religion. You crazy religious fool, I want nothing to do with you. Listen, it seems like there's no hope. Can God do it? Can God do it? I hope you believe that today, church. I hope that you believe that God is still the same, the same today as he was yesterday, the same that he's going to be forever. Those are not just words that we say. Those are words that we witness as the Bible comes alive. And we see problems, real problems. And God has a solution for them. Just like in your life, there are real problems. Real problems. And God says, just wait and see. Just wait and see. Christian, don't grow weary. Do not faint. Whatever your trial is, whatever your storm is, don't let go of Jesus. We don't just say that Jesus is the answer to all things. We really mean it. Jesus is the answer to that lost loved one. Jesus is the answer to that problem at work. Jesus is the answer to that sick loved one. Jesus is the answer. I hope you believe that today. Lastly, I'll close with this. If Jesus is the answer, 
If he truly is the answer, and we believe that, then how should we act, Christian? How should we act? Because we're screaming it from the mountain times. Jesus is the answer. And yet we're trying to take on the problem ourselves. That's eye opening, right? Jesus is the answer. And I'm trying to take on the problem myself. I stand in the front of the line. And Lord, I'll just say it right now. I'm sorry. It is very clear that I, I mess up things when I take it upon myself. But we're taught that his mercies are new every day because why? We mess up every day. Every day we mess up. And Jesus says, no, just come to me. As you stand. I don't know if there's anyone here who needs to pray. The altars are always open. We're more than willing to pray with you. That's what we're called to do. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Uplift one another. Edify one another. Church, Jesus is the answer, and that's not a cliche. That's facts. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we once again say thank you, Lord, for just for another opportunity to just see your word come to life. We see true problems in the Bible, Lord, and yet we also see you give us the answer. You give us an answer to every situation. And just like you've proven yourself through your word, Father, you prove yourself every day through our daily lives. Forgive me, Father. As I say to my shame, I stand at the front of the line where I try to take control of the situation. But you are the answer. You have the answer. Father, give me strength. Give me strength in my weakness. Help my church out, Lord. Help them bear unto you and bear your image to this world. Father, we just love you and we praise you. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.